Lady Aurelia Malis is the Archon, or ruler, of the Drukhari Cabal known as the Poisoned Tongue. Much like the other members of her Cabal, Malis is an incredibly intelligent and manipulative individual, with a wit as sharp as a razor's edge. With her intelligence and cunning, calculating mind, Malice brought her cabal to a preeminent position within Camoran society, often by manipulating her allies to bear the brunt of the assault within any sort of conflict, and in turn allowing Malice and her forces to later swoop in to reap the rewards of such endeavours. So keen is Malice's mind that she has even been seen as an intellectual equal to the supreme overlord of Camorra, as Drubal Vect himself, being able to match wits with Vect in a way no other individual has been able to achieve. This intrigued and impressed the ruler of the Drukhari to such an extent that Vect took Malice as his lover. Over time, Malice would ascend higher within the ranks of Camorran society, and would eventually become a part of Asdrubal Vect's inner circle, becoming one of the most politically powerful individuals within the entire Drukhari race. For whatever reason, relations between Vect and Malice would sour, and the ruler of Camorra would banish Malice from his royal court. Some believe that Vect felt threatened by Malice, fearing that she might one day challenge his right to rule. Others, such as Duke Sliscus, state that Vect simply grew bored with her, and sought to discard her like a broken plaything. Whatever the truth of the matter, Malice was enraged, and with a handful of her most loyal followers, she would briefly leave Camorra and wander the depths of the webway for a time in a self-imposed exile. It was here that Malice would encounter the laughing god Chagorak deep within the wilderness of the webway. Chigorik would banish Malice's retinue before challenging the mortal to a contest of wills, where the loser would offer up their heart to the winner. To both their mutual surprise, Malice would best the Laughing God, who would then fade back into the ether, leaving only a blade and a large crystal that pulsated with light as the sole trace of his existence. Malice, maddened by her ordeal and hungering for revenge against her former lover, would then take up the blade and use it to cut out her own heart, replacing it with the one made out of crystal. She would then return to Kimura and begin to plot her revenge, by slowly yet surely regaining her lost political power. The meeting between Lady Malice and Chagorak was said to have been orchestrated by the Harlequin troop known as the Veiled Path, and Malice's act of implanting the Crystal Heart into her body would create an arcane bond with the Laughing God. Ever since Malice implanted the Crystal Heart into her body, her demeanour and personality would undergo a drastic and unsettling change. In combat, she would become incredibly savage and brutal, fighting with insane levels of strength and fury. Slowly but surely, Malice would begin climbing back up the ladder of Camoran society. But whenever she was alone, she would gaze at her reflection and grin madly before erupting into uncontrollable fits of hysteric laughter. A laughter that would sound as if it came from two separate voices one being that of Lady Malice, and the other being of someone, or rather something else entirely. Such a change in her behaviour is itself a stark contrast to her normally aloof and condescending manner. This would seem to suggest that Chagorak has become physically bonded to Lady Malice, forming a sort of symbiotic relationship between the two. Warp entities forming symbiotic or parasitic relationships with mortals is not an uncommon occurrence, as the possessed of the heretic Astartes 
such as the Gal Vorbach from the time of the Horus Heresy, also allowed demonic entities of the Warp to parasitically bond with their bodies. Similar to Lady Malice, such bonded individuals will also have a voice that seemingly comes from two separate throats, the voice of the host and the voice of the demon. One of the most infamous in this regard was the word bearer known as Argoltal, who was one of the very first Astartes to bond with a warp-born entity. The benefits of such a union are twofold. Firstly, the possessed gains an increase in strength and power, as well as an influx of new abilities, such as flight or being able to unleash torrents of warp fire. The second is that the demon that has bonded with them can now exist within real space. Real space as a whole is highly toxic to warp-born entities, and without a constant influx of warp energy to sustain them, they will be quickly banished back to the Immaterium. The crystal heart that Chagoric left behind for Malice is also similar in description to a spirit stone, which itself is constructed from a psychically conductive crystalline substance. Most spirit stones are harvested from the crone worlds deep within the warp space rift known as the Eye of Terror, and at least one material used in their construction is said to be that of crystallized psychic energy. Since both gods and demons are made from the very power of the warp, which itself is, to grossly oversimplify, a sea of psychic energy, then it seems logical to assume that such entities, given thousands, tens of thousands, or even millions of years, could potentially have a crystallized core of psychic energy somewhere within their being. But all this aside, why would Jagorak want to be bonded to Lady Malice at all? The most obvious answer would be a matter of being able to traverse the material realm. The more powerful a warp entity is, the more time and energy is required to summon it into real space. Lesser demons can be brought into the material realm in a matter of minutes or hours, whereas a greater demon can take anywhere between several hours to many days. As for a god entering the material realm, there have been at least two such examples. The first of which being that of the Eldari god of war, Kayla Mensha Cain, whose form was shattered and scattered throughout real space, where each shard of the god would take root within the core of a craft world. But even then, whenever one of these shards, now known as avatars, are to be awakened, it still requires a ritual blood sacrifice, which can still be an undertaking of many hours. As a result, it is more akin to summoning a greater demon as opposed to a fully fledged god. The second instance is detailed within the story Labyrinth within the Heroes of the Space Marines anthology, with the minor chaos god Malice. Malice would be brought into real space by the Sons of Malice Chaos Space Marine Warband after they undertook a ritual that lasted for over 11 centuries and sacrificing 11 specially chosen souls to give Malice the power to enter real space, due to the number 11 being sacred to this deity. However, how long Malice managed to remain within the material realm is unknown, meaning that he could have been banished back into the warp after several minutes, hours, days or even weeks. Given that summoning a god into the material realm can take at the very minimum several centuries to achieve, possessing a mortal form is a far more convenient solution. But given his choice in regards with who to bond with, this then raises yet another question. Why bond with a member of the Drukhari and not a member of the Harlequins, who are themselves devout in their worship of Chagorak? It's worth noting that Chagorak has access to the Black Library which itself contains the entirety of the Eldari race's studies 
and knowledge of the warp and chaos. Included within its collected works are copies of the Book of Magnus, written by the Thousand Suns Primarch Magnus the Red, and even a copy of the Book of the Ranadandra, which details the end of the universe. With such a vast repository of knowledge at his fingertips, Chikorak could have easily discovered something that the Seers of the Black Library may have not. Quite possibly, the destruction of Cain's Gate. Cain's Gate is a structure deep within the bowels of Kimura that is a doorway into the warp itself. It is locked with numerous chains and surrounded by caged nulls in order to prevent it from opening. However, during the 13th Black Crusade, Lady Malice would learn that the gate structure was slowly weakening, as well as the fact that Asdrubal Vect was stationing his rivals around its vicinity, so that if the gate should fail, his rivals would be the ones affected as opposed to him. Malice believed that Vect had intended to break the seals and open the gate, in order to utilize the demonic entities behind it to dispose of his rivals once and for all. To this end, Malice and Vect would engage in bitter skirmishes with forces loyal to one another, such as their respective cabals, incubi mercenaries, and even members of the witch cults. But while the two forces clashed, both Malice and Vect were seemingly unaware that they sought the same outcome of preventing whatever lay on the other side of the gate from ever entering Kamora. This would all be for naught, however, as when the gladiatrix Ivrain would be resurrected as the emissary of Iniad, the nascent god of the dead, the gate of Cain would be shattered by the resulting psychic shockwave, and demons would pour into Kamora en masse. Perhaps Chagorak had sought to prevent such a demonic incursion from happening, unaware of Vect's true intentions. While the Jukari may be perverse, cruel, and utterly sadistic, they are still children of Isha, and given how the Harlequins are allowed free reign within Kimura, the Drukari still clearly hold some measure of respect towards the Laughing God. Perhaps fearing that Vect would consort with demons and damn the Drukari to having their souls devoured by Slanesh, Chikorak would anoint Malice as being Vect's successor, in order to spare the Drukari from damnation. If this were the case, then Chikorak's plan might have well succeeded if the unexpected psychic shockwave of Iniad stirring within the warp hadn't occurred, as it would appear that no one, mortal or god alike, could have foreseen such an outcome from happening. But perhaps Chagorak's plan is to help transform Asdrubal Vect into a Dark Muse. Dark Muses are minor deities of the ancient Eldari pantheon, essentially the equivalent of saints or angels. Following the demonic incursion that spilled forth from the Broken Gate of Cain, Astrubalvect himself would be assassinated by a pack of creatures known as Mandrakes. Many within Kimura believe that these creatures acted on the behalf of Lady Malice, who along with her cabal fled Kimura to avoid retribution from those loyal to Vect. In addition to slaying his mortal form, the Mandrakes would destroy every single receptacle that contained Vect's essence, to make sure that the homunculi covens would be unable to resurrect him. A grand funerary ceremony is then held within the Nexus, having been orchestrated by the Harlequins of the Veiled Path, the same troop who devised Malice's encounter with Chagorak. During this great wake, many of the Archons who attended would be slaughtered by the Harlequins, and as their blood flowed across the floor of the Nexus, it would begin to take form, before manifesting as the reborn as Drubal Vect. Those Archons who were loyal to Vect would be resurrected by the homunculi coven known as the Prophets of Flesh, and those who were not would be reborn as tortured 
and twisted slave creatures living in agonizing service to the Lord of Camorra. Upon his rebirth, Vect would then declare himself as being a living dark muse. While it is possible that Vect could be speaking in grand hyperbole, what if he did become a more divine figure in order to aid the Drukhari against the increasing tide of chaos that coincided with the advent of the Secretrix Meledictum, the warp tear that split the galaxy in two? Perhaps Jagorak, by implanting his divine essence into Malice, and making Vect into a demigod by transforming him into a dark muse, is part of a grander plan to possibly even create an entirely new generation of gods to replace those devoured by Slanesh, with both Vect and Malice being essentially the Adam and Eve of this new pantheon. But then again, there may not be any grand plan or design in place, and Chigorak could have simply given his heart to Lady Malice for no other reason than the trickster god found it amusing. What do you think? Leave a comment below, and thanks for watching.